Hey everyone, today we are again talking about particles. You might have seen the 3D animation that we recently put out. That was really just a personal project of mine to teach myself to work in ACES. For that I've created these bubble particles and I thought maybe it's fun to talk about those. Let's begin by placing down a simple P emitter. And as always we need a P renderer, otherwise we don't see anything. And the P emitter for this kind of animation, I will choose line in the region and I'll drag the start line a little bit to the left. Playing this, we only see that our particles are being spawned on the line, not moving, not doing anything. Um, but before we're going to head into the style tab, I'm going to choose N gun, the circle, and I'm going to change the size to be a little bit smaller. Variants. Great. Let's head into the controls tab. And first things first, we need these particles to be moving. And we do that in the velocity tab. I'm going to add in some velocity, and right off the bat, we see these particles are moving to the side. We need them to move up. This is why we're going to change the angle to 90 degrees. Now they're moving up and that's not really looking good. So also on the velocity, we're going to add in some variance. And the reason why they're going um, to the other side, not, not all particles are going up, this is because of the variance. If this is set higher than the velocity, then the variance can cause the particles to go uh, in the minus direction, in the minus velocity. But this won't really bother us for this type of animation. Um, I still prefer to do it like this. The reason for that is simply because if we set the velocity high and the velocity variance just below or just exactly like the velocity, then yes, we can have particles uh, going very, very slow, but that almost never happens. This is why I'm setting the velocity variance higher and live with the fact that some particles are moving downwards. Next, we will limit the amount of particles uh, because we don't want them to keep spawning. I will do that by animating the number and number variance slider. Yeah, this is good. Next, uh, we can't really judge the velocity if we don't already have our P friction. The P friction will essentially take out energy out of the simulation, works similar to air resistance. This is already looking quite good. Let's give them more lifespan. Let's add in P turbulence. And if we're looking at this with the P turbulence, I don't like that the particles are being affected um, for such a long time. I only want some turbulence, I want some randomization at the very beginning, because I want this ex explosion type of effect. And this is why in the strength of a life, I'm going to reduce this quite sharply. So really only in the beginning um, of our particles, they will be affected by the turbulence. But because I've set this to a thousand, this will be uh, still a long time. So I'm going to reduce this to uh, 215 is our animation long playing this, you can see these particles are only affected at the very beginning, and then the turbulence is completely gone. But now I'm going to increase the density slider right here. This means that the um, noise that is applied will be finer, more details, which means that the particles um, are going in more different directions. If I change this, then they are almost moving in the same direction because the resolution of the noise is very low. Increasing this will increase. It's pretty much like the detail slider on a fast noise. And now you can see more, more randomness happening. And I'm going to increase the strength a little bit. Yeah, this is looking good. Next, I want these particles to slowly keep rising. This is why I'm using a P directional force. And by default, this is set to emulate gravity. 
So we need this direction to be 90. And the strength is too much. A very gentle upwards force. Yeah, this is looking good. And next we want our particles or our bubbles to attract each other because we really want to see this uh, bubble action going. So for that we use the p-flock. This will force particles to flock to each other. By default the flock number is very low and there's a reason because this is very <laughs> CPU intensive. Um, if we increase this too much this can cause your computer to crash or fusion to calculate for ages. Uh, but we have very few particles so uh, you should be fine as well even if your computer isn't so good. Um, in my initial example I've set this to 6 and that's really just about increasing these numbers and these values until we find something that we like. Okay, I think I found something that I like. So flock number is still set to 6, follow strength is um, 0 0.002, attract strength is 0 0.009 and I've reduced the minimum and maximum uh, attraction length or distance. That they're using and another important thing for this effect is i've under conditions i've changed the probability to a zero zero point three this will mean that the particles on each frame have a chance of zero point three or about thirty two percent um chance of being affected by this um by this force this gives a little bit more of a random uh, animation than keeping this on one can decrease this to decrease the actual attraction effect. This is actually quite nice. So yeah, I've actually decreased this even more and it's still looking good. Just play around with the numbers until uh, until you find something that you like. That's pretty much all for our particles. Next, we're going to render this. I'm going to choose a merge 3D. I'm not going to use the uh, 2D render mode on here. I'm going to use the Merge 3D and add in a camera. Place my viewport the way that I want. And then I'm going to look at the Merge 3D. So I'm in the Merge where my camera is. And I'm going to right click, copy POV to camera 3D. And now we can look through our camera 3D. And now if we move around, we are also going to move the camera. So I'm going to go into perspective mode again. And let's use a renderer 3D to render our particles. Okay, this is too far on the left. So I'm going to move my camera slightly. Okay, now that we have rendered our particles to a 2D image, let's look at actually creating the bubble effect or the fluid effect. And for that, we are going to drop down a blur tool and I keep everything at default for now. I'm just going to increase the blur size quite a bit. And next we will put down a brightness contrast tool. And in this brightness contrast tool, we are going to clip the low and the high points. We're going to increase the contrast until we've gotten back a very sharp image. And as you can see, now we already have the bubble effect going on. And you can increase the uh, influence radius, basically, by increasing the blur size. This will, of course, also get rid, at some point, this will get rid of the smaller particles. So you need to make sure you're not losing too much detail. You can fix a few of these issues by changing or playing around with the low and high sliders until you have the effect that you want. Quick note from future Noah. Um, I've realized I didn't explain why I've chosen a blur and then clipped the black and white points using a brightness contrast instead of just using two road dilate nodes. And this is a good question if you've asked that because in 3D, for example, we would use several uh, erode and dilate tools to uh, increase and decrease the voxels to create a smoothing on our uh, fluid simulation. That's pretty much also what I did when I was creating the fluid simulations for the 3D water in the background of my fake ad. And this is actually the first thing that I tried when I created these bubbles, these 2D bubbles, but that caused immense flickering. So I'm just 
going to show you real quick. Yeah, and as you can see, this is also a nice effect, but this is more prone to flickering. If you look at this particle right here, because it's so small, the filter operation is constantly killing it and then bringing it back. And the method of using the blur is much, much safer for this kind of effect. But now we stumbled upon an issue, and that is our particles are flickering when they reach the edge. This is because of our blur operation, which as you can see on the edges, this won't interpolate correctly. And if you've used Fusion for some time, you might know that most of these issues can be fixed by setting the clipping mode from frame to none. But this will also mean that the particles will drop in and out very quickly. As you can see, this looks like it's being sucked away instead of just leaving the frame. So what we're going to do is on the blur, we're changing the clipping mode to domain, which changed a little bit, but this is because our domain is only the resolution of our image right now. And if you don't know what the domain is, you can activate that or you can visualize that. It's always active, but you can visualize that by going in the menu on the upper right corner of the viewer and under region, show domain of de definition. And this is now the area that Fusion is currently processing on that node. And for example, Fusion will only process where there is an active region. Let's look at the ellipse tool right quite quickly. The ellipse tool, for example, right here, uh, you can see that the actual domain that Fusion is rendering is much smaller than the actual resolution of our canvas. And if I'm going to move this, you can see the domain will adjust accordingly. Okay, and back to our brightness contrast. And as you can see, the domain is cut off right at the edges of our canvas. But if we want to increase the resolution a little bit so that our particles stop flickering at the edges. We can do that on our renderer 3D, either by simply increasing the resolution and cropping the image later, or what I'm going to show you right now, just as a little tip, we can use the domain overscan. I'm just going to increase this. And as you can see, the edges will increase. And now Fusion is going to render these parts, even though they're not visible, Fusion will still calculate them correctly. I'll set this to 1.1. And now if we're looking at our particles, we have no more flickering at the edges and they just move out of the frame without any, without any issues, without any seeming collisions. And in my original examples, I actually added in a bitmap tool and then I increased the uh, clipping even more. You could also drop down another brightness contrast tool, but because we are using this as a mask, I've just simply used a bitmap mask. So on our background, I'm going to change this to vertical. I'm going to choose two colors that I like. Yeah, this is looking good. Okay, now let's look at creating the specular point on our bubbles. For that, I'm going to use a, a road dilate. And I'm going to set this to circle. I'm going to increase this. And I'm going to choose another one. And I'm going to decrease this. And this is really just to get an additional smoothing going on, similar to the blur that we've used right here. And next, we're going to merge this on top of our original bubbles. And right now, they're obviously the same color. But we can or decrease the alpha gain. I'm going to use a background a brightness contrast to decrease saturation. And then I'm going to move this up and to the right a little bit. And right now this is too big for me. So I'm going to decrease the amount on our second row dilate quite a bit more. Now it's gone completely. Okay. Yeah, this is a really nice specular point. And again, we're going to have an issue with the edges, because if you remember, we've pushed this upwards. So right here, we don't have any speculars. Because if we go right here, yeah, the speculars are cut off because there isn't any more resolution. And you could go the lazy way and simply set this to 
uh, duplicate. But then this would also again mean we have this stretching at the edges. Can be a nice effect, but it's not what we're going after. So I'm going to set this back to canvas. And I'm simply going to increase the resolution of our background until we see everything that we need. Because our mask is much bigger than the resolution that we're going to render, we don't have any issues with increasing the resolution. Okay, and now let's look back at our merge. And it's still cut off, of course, but this is only because our re resolution is now bigger. Let's drop down a crop, which is by default set to the project resolution. And if we set this to keep centered, this is now the original resolution that we had and it's placed correctly. And now on the edges, we have no stretching. They simply look as if they were coming from below without any issues at the edges. And that's all for this effect. I know this was a much shorter tutorial than I usually do, but I hope this was still a, a fun and nice effect for you to learn. Okay, see ya.